You know, if there's one difficult reality that I think has really been driven home during this COVID-19 experience, it's that scarcity is scary. Scarcity is really scary. But you know, oddly enough, the first place where we all experience this fear of scarcity was with toilet paper. It was with good old TP. Now, pardon the bathroom humor, but we've all felt alarmed at some point of running out of toilet paper. And not having an extra roll around the house, well, that's bad enough. But not being able to go to a grocery store and buy more, well, that took this fear of scarcity to a whole nother level. And we all had different kinds of, respo- of responses to this scarcity. Some of us went out and we bought so much toilet paper that we now feel like we own stock in Charmin Ultra. Others of us went to the internet to complain about people buying too much toilet paper. And still others of us bummed toilet paper off of neighbors and relatives that had bought too much. Now, although the fear of scarcity around toilet paper was somewhat humorous, the shortage of hospital beds, the shortage of ventilators, face masks, face shields, the shortage of test kits, of money, of jobs. Well, those scarcities, well, they were just scary. They were just frightening. And as we got more and more caught up in those fears, do you know what followed again and again? Anger. Anger tends to follow fear around like a shadow. Certainly fear isn't the only source or cause for anger, but it's definitely a chief offender. See, what you and I tend to do when we get scared is we try to control things. And this happens with you and your kids and you and your boss. We try to control things when we get scared. And that control might look different from situation to situation. But when we feel threatened or we see our control failing or we realize that our typical means of controlling a situation just aren't working, oftentimes our fear flips to anger. And you can see that kind of anger being driven by fear all over the place right now. But honestly, we don't need to see it or hear about it to understand it, do we? Because most of us are already experiencing it. And there's probably a whole group of people in your mind right now that you are angry at. You're angry because of the choice that they made to go there or to shut that down or that they didn't follow the limits on that or whatever. And what's driving a lot, not all, but a lot of that anger is fear. It's fear. And if that anger sticks around long enough, the result in you or in me is going to be a hardening effect where bitterness, judgmentalism, uh, or some other kind of coping mechanism sets in with that resentment. And friends, this was the case long before COVID-19, and this is going to be the case long after. But thankfully, for a follower of Jesus Christ, That's not the only response. Your only response isn't fear, control, and anger. In fact, there's another response that's available to you. And it's the one that I want to unpack for us today as we open up our Bibles. I want to invite you that if this is hitting home for you, to open up your Bible to Matthew chapter 14, verse 13. And what we're going to see along the way is what this response is, why it matters, and how it happens. So open up to Matthew chapter 14 with us. Now, before we read this text, there's a piece of context that's really important to know. See, all four Gospels, all four accounts of Jesus' life and ministry here on earth, they all record the same two miracles. All four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John document the miracle of the resurrection And that just makes sense because the resurrection is the event that Christianity rises or or falls on. But the second miracle that they all document might be one that even if you know your Bibles, might surprise you. I know it surprised me. 
And this miracle, and the fact that it's recorded by all four Gospels, that really underscores its importance as we look at it. And it's the one we're, uh, that we see in our passage today. So take a look at it with me in Matthew chapter 14, beginning in verse 13. It says this, Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. Now hang on. What is it that made Jesus want to get in a boat with his disciples and go out into the middle of nowhere? Well, we learned from the previous verses that Herod Antipas, the ruler of that region who had recently put John the Baptist to death, had now taken a new and a very serious interest in Jesus and his miracles. And so with this added political tension and having been exhausted by serving the crowds night and day, Jesus sought rest and solitude. But we're told this in the next breath. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them. Circle that. Next. And when he healed their sick, now, uh, and he healed their sick. Now, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place. And the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, don't don't miss this. They need not go away. You give them something to eat. Now make sure you catch what's going on here. With tensions high and energy low, Jesus chooses to show compassion on the crowds. And then hours later, with time running out, the disciples come to him and make a suggestion. They uh, realize that, that everybody has to travel by daylight and people are getting hungry. And so they encourage Jesus to do the logical thing that he oftentimes did, which was to dismiss the crowd so that they would have enough time to go and get something to eat before the day was over. But Jesus, when resources are low and hunger is high, calls on the disciples to instead feed the crowds. This is a shocking uh, suggestion, a shocking command to a very logical suggestion and solution. Being in ministry for uh, almost a decade now, I've had to be involved in feeding hundreds of people several times. And I can tell you this, I hate it. It takes all kinds of planning and organizing and preparing and, and getting ready to be able to feed hundreds of people. So I can't imagine the kind of efforts that it would take to feed thousands in fact, what we find out from the, a couple of verses later on in this passage is that there were, that there were at least 5,000 men alone, not including women and children. So there's probably a crowd of 10 to 20,000 people total. Oh, and by the way, it's four o'clock and you're in the middle of nowhere. This is literally an impossible task and it's Jesus who's giving it to them. Don't ever say that God won't give you more than you can handle because he will. Definitely, Jesus promises, we're promised in the scriptures that we will never be tempted to sin beyond what we can bear. But God will most certainly call on you and I to go way beyond our limitations out of obedience to him. And that's what the disciples are being called on to do. And so what would you do if you're one of the disciples? Well, when your boss hands you an impossible task, it probably deserves an impossible solution. Verse 17, we see, they said to him, we have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said to them, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets, one basket for each of the 12 disciples, full of broken pieces left over. 
And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Now that's a miracle. That's a major miracle. And this miracle, like the rest of the miracles that we have in the gospel, they're recorded for the purpose of confirming Jesus' identity and message. That's their primary function. And the way that Matthew lays out this miracle, the primary audience for that confirmation, for that teaching about who Jesus is, was the disciples. This miracle were, was meant to teach them something about who he was. That in the midst of exhaustion and being out in the middle of nowhere, that in the face of a crowd of needs, that Jesus, this Jesus who responds to com with compassion, even when tensions are high and supplies are low, that this Jesus was offering a teaching to his disciples and to us today about who they're with. And we need to see this. We need to realize who we're with when Jesus takes you and I and puts us into a crazy situation out of his compassion. That we better know who we're with and we need to internalize the reality that we are walking with a God who isn't limited by our limitations. Let me say that again so none of us miss this. God isn't limited by our limitations. That's the God we're with. That's the example that Jesus set for us here with the example that he modeled. And so when we consider what is our response to the fear of scarcity in this season, as a follower of Jesus Christ, our response isn't fear, but faith. Not fear, but faith. Because we are walking with a God who isn't limited by our limitations. Gang, think about it. You are literally with a God who invented the immune system and defeated death. You serve a God who raises up and tears down nations as he chooses. You are uh, walking today with a God who sovereignly knew that this situation was going to come and who allowed it to come your way. He's not surprised by any of the things that are going on. You are with a God who is able to provide for anyone, anywhere, anytime. That's who you're with. And because that's who he is, think about all of the limitations of this situation that didn't limit him. He wasn't limited by the number of people who had a problem. He wasn't limited by the position of the sun, the time of day it was. He wasn't limited by the preferences of the people. He wasn't limited also by the portion that the disciples brought him or the personal faith of the people or the disciples. And he also wasn't limited by the political tensions he was under. None of those things limited him. And none of our problems, our situations, our sicknesses today limit him either. None of the shortages or scarcities that we're experiencing limit him. And if we know that, if we believe that that's who we're walking with, then let me ask you, what are you scared of? What are you afraid of? I don't ask that to make light of our fears uh, or to uh, uh, write off the hardships and problems that you and I are facing and trying our best to handle. They're real. They're genuine. They're hard. And because they're real, our response to them really matters. And that's why we need to know what a different response other than fear, control, and anger looks like. So that we can trust his plan for us and for everyone else. Now, before you're tempted to maybe write off the rest of this message because you're somebody who knows that God is all-powerful and that he can't possibly be limited by you and I, I want to point out that in all of the Gospels, not only do they record this miracle, but in all the Gospels, they also later on record a comment about it. All of them point out uh, from Jesus' own lips how the crowd or the disciples, they missed the point of the miracle. All of them missed or forgot 
or didn't understand the point of this miracle every time. So friend, I want you to encourage you to realize and not underestimate how easy it is to simply forget or misunderstand who you're walking with as a follower of Jesus. It's easier than you think. It's easier than you think. And so then gleaning this truth may be harder than you're giving it credit for. But grasping this truth so that your faith is growing instead of your fear matters so much. It matters because where your faith goes, so goes your obedience. Let me say that another way. Your obedience follows your faith. Your obedience follows your faith. Just like anger and fear tend to go together, so does obedience and faith. That's why internalizing this truth matters. If you don't know Jesus very well, or you don't trust him very much, what we sometimes call intimacy with God, then you are really going to struggle to obey when the situation gets hard. When his request for your obedience, his command of your obedience gets harder. When we, that happens, then we're not going to follow. We're not going to listen to what he has to say. And that just makes common sense, right? In fact, it reminds me of when GPS first came out. Do you remember that? You remember having those little devices stuck onto our dashboards? We oftentimes uh, started arguing with those devices, didn't we? I remember arguing with mine again and again. Why? Well, because I didn't trust it. There had been stories of people blindly following their GPS device right over a cliff or something like that. But as time went on and things got better, you know what? I learned to trust it. I learned to have faith in it. And today, I barely leave home without plugging in my destination first. That's how much I trust it. My faith grew, and obedience follows faith. And so internalizing this reality of who you're with as a Christian is so important, because as your faith grows, so does your obedience. Then even if God puts you, literally, into a, an impossible situation, like the one we're in, then you can still obey. Because your obedience isn't based on your faith in yourself and your control in your resources and your abilities, but they are based on God who isn't limited by all of our limitations who isn't limited by all of our scarcities. Listen, fear and anger don't have to dominate your response. So before we answer the third question of how this happens, at, and we see how we can put this into practice during this season, I, I want to encourage you to consider how you would describe your response to this situation so far. Just to do a little self-reflection and to think about if your family was to describe your response or your Facebook page could somehow describe your response or if your inner thought life was able to put words to how your response has been, what would it say? You know, as I've talked with many of us over this past month, what I've heard time and time again is about the test of our faith that people are experiencing. Again and again, I've heard stories of how people's faith are being tested. And so I think that it's a mixed bag. I think your thoughts and my thoughts and our Facebook pages would probably be, probably be a mixed bag of responses where you could sure sometimes see where we are leaning on God's power, on his sovereignty, doing what's right, having compassion in the way that we are looking at and treating others. But you know what we probably also see? We probably also see plenty of times when we are just overwhelmed even by just thinking of this situation. You, we would probably see other times uh, of anger and frustration because we are upset, frankly, because other people are making choices and decisions that we don't think that they should make, that we don't want them to make. And because of that, we are angry. And what's underlining a lot of that anger is simply fear. 
We're afraid of what might happen if they go there, if they do that, if they make that decision. What might happen to us, to those we love, to those we work with, if they make those choices? Sound familiar? I know it does for me. Friends, it's easy to forget who we're with and to embrace the response of fear. But we don't have to be dominated by fear during this season. But instead, our faith can mature. How does that happen? How does this truth that God isn't limited by my limitations get internalized? It happens through the experience of obedience. The experience of obedience. It's when we are actually out there facing a shortage, a problem, an issue, and we respond in obedience and see how God isn't limited by our limitations. Listen, the disciples, they didn't cook up some crazy idea of having a giant picnic out in the middle of nowhere and then come to Jesus and expect him to fund it. No. In fact, it was the other way around. God put them into the impossible situation and called on them to bring him what they had. And you know what? He might do the same with you and I. And I think that's exactly where our fear as a follower of Jesus can really get sparked. Because we know if we have faith in God that he might just call on it. If we're looking at him and saying, all we have is fill in the blank. This is our last roll of toilet paper. This is our last dollar. This is all the time we have left that he might just look at you. He might just look at me and call our bluff and say, bring it to me. Bring it to me. That is the experience where our faith, though, has the opportunity to grow. That's the experience, or as Scripture oftentimes calls it, the trial, where our faith meets obedience and it grows. Verse 19 paints a very practical picture of this for us. Then he, Jesus, ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds. Imagine the faith that that would have taken to take the only food you have and to break off a piece of it and to give it to somebody else. And then to break off another piece of it and give it to somebody else. And to do that again And then again, and then somehow again, a thousand times over, as Jesus provided, not all at once, but bit by bit, piece by piece. That is how this happens. This response that deeply matters happens through experience the experience of obedience. When God takes us and he puts us in that hardship and then walks alongside of us step by step, paycheck by paycheck, roll by roll, day by day. That's how our faith grows. As George Mueller once put it, the only way to learn strong faith is to endure great trials. And you know, Mueller knew something about facing this issue of scarcity. See, George Mueller lived during the 19th century. And he isn't remembered for the amazing leader he was or his intellect or the books that he wrote. Instead, he is remembered for one thing and one thing only. Having faith in the face of having nothing. Having faith in the face of nothing. George Mueller was famous for being able to, without ever borrowing, without ever asking somebody directly, and with being poor himself, care for over 10,000 orphans in England. And time after time, there's story after story of when he had done the best he could to provide, that he would gather his wife and he would gather his staff and they would pray together and they would leave the matter of the need in God's hands. And then God would provide. 
Not always how George had expected or how George had hoped that God would provide, but instead God provided what George truly needed every time. Writing about faith, Mueller said, faith has nothing to do with feelings or with impressions, with improbabilities or with outward experiences. If we desire to couple such things with faith, then we are no longer resting on the word of God because faith needs nothing of the kind. Faith rests on the naked word of God. When we take him at his word, the heart is at peace. Church, that's what I want for you. That's what my heart's desire is for you during this season that you would have a different response and ergo a different experience other than fear, control, and anger. That instead, you would have the response of faith and enjoy a peace that surpasses understanding during this season as you instead have a faith that obeys and even shows compassion on others. That's my desire for you. That's my heart for you, that you would have faith in the one that you are walking through this trial with. And so, if that's you, I want to invite you to consider that your faith, what is it? Well, what is a need that maybe you need to have faith with, where you need to say, I only have fill in the blank. I only have this. I only have this much. This is the only thing I have left. What is it? What is it that God is calling on you in the midst of this season to have faith and obey? Can you respond to that need? Can you respond to that obedience by saying, God, it's yours. It's yours. I want to invite you to take some time after this message to write out what that response is. Take time to reframe what that issue is that you're facing as a test of your faith during this season. Because I want to invite you to then share it with somebody else after you've written it out. And to step into the experience of obedience, realizing that God won't be limited by our limitations. He's not limited by the way I want him to provide for me or what I want him to provide or the problem I'm dealing with. None of it. My problems and them are not going to limit the way that he can respond and the way that he can use my obedience. That's the kind of strong faith in you that he is after through this trial. And so don't be surprised. Don't be surprised then. If after this season of faith and obedience, if you, like the disciples, don't walk away with a basket full of rewards and reminders that God isn't limited by our limitations and that the greatest reward that you get to enjoy and that I hope I get to enjoy is faith instead of fear. Amen? Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for meeting us here in the midst of this trial, that in the midst of us having less or us feeling like we have nothing, that you are meeting us here, that in your compassion, in your sovereignty, you knew that we would be right here. And God, I ask that you would, through this, build our faith, that we would still obey, that we would still do what is right and to come to you. For some of us, God, I realize that this might be a time when we are coming to you and what we need to say is, God, I only have my heart. But God, that's all that you're asking for. Some of us need to come to you and offer our heart and soul to you for the first time. To invite you to come in to forgive all of the brokenness, all of the sin that we've accumulated and to become our Jesus, to become our Savior. For others of us, God, we need that challenge from you to surrender and to obey even when we don't feel like it, even when we are fearful so that we can have our faith experience the growth that you want for us through this season. And God, we lay these things at your feet, trusting that you're gonna come through for us, thankful that you've loved us and shown us your compassion. And we now wanna respond in obedience. And we pray these things in your name.
Amen.